Hello guys, before we get to the actual video, I'd like to just quickly set it up. This was part of our 24 hour charity live stream for Child's Play. If you would like to donate or find out more about Child's Play, we'll include a link in the description below. We'll also throw in links to our social media accounts so you can follow everyone who is involved with this. With that out of the way, let's go ahead and start the video. Excellent. All right. All right, is everyone ready? I think I am. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. All right, our next ghost is none other than Liam Edwards. Liam became formally involved with the video game industry when he interned at GameSpot. After writing several articles, Liam set his targets on working within a major video game company. He eventually landed at Rockstar Games, where he worked on a little game called uh, Grand Theft Auto 4, uh, 5. Afterwards, he left Rockstar and moved to Japan to be closer to the mecca of video games. He started a weekly podcast where he sends his guests to a deserted place of their choosing called Final Games. It has re received almost near universal acclaim for Liam's hosting ability and interesting guests. Uh, Mr. Edwards is now working on some indie projects in his spare time, as well as teaching English and running Final Games. Please help me in welcoming my friend, Liam. Hey, thank you very much for having me. Yeah. How are you guys doing? <laughs> Pretty great. <laughs> Pretty great. <laughs> as always. Hi. Tired, I can imagine. <laughs> I'm actually. I'm a little bit tired. I'm a little bit tired, but it's because it was for me 4 a.m. at one point and now 11 o'clock. So, yeah. But I'm actually. Push... I'm okay right now, actually. Yeah? Really? Yeah, I feel, I feel like I could uh, stream for another couple hours, but I won't because, um, you know, I need to go outside oh. at some point. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I'm going to come and join you for a, for a bit. Yeah. Okay, so let's get started with this interview. Um, so Excellent. the first uh, hard-hitting question that we have is, why do you banish so many wonderful people? Who hurt you? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, why do I banish people? Especially all of the incredibly talented people who have been on the show. Um, I don't know. Uh, they all seem to survive. And they all somehow escape and make wonderful games or continue to do wonderful things. So I don't know how strong my banishing is, really. It seems people last like a day and then they end up going back to their normal lives. Uh, <laughs> but it would be interesting if I really did have the power to banish people to a deserted realm and slowly but surely everyone in the video game industry just disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> and we all know who's responsible for it. <laughs> Well, yeah, well, yeah, I guess it, it, the number one suspect would be me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You have a lot of interesting guests on your show. Are there any particular episodes that you recommend? To, or you recommend? Uh, there, are, there have been quite a few. I, I'm, I'm extremely lucky in the guests I have on the show are quite noteworthy people. Um, Especially game devs recently, we've had quite a, fa a few amazing guests recently. Um, we had uh, this week alone, we had John Riccardi from 84. Some mm -hmm. people might know the 84 Play podcast, and also they're the studio that does localization for games like Fire Emblem and Monster Hunter, and uh, they did Near Automata last year and stuff like that. Uh, we also had Harvey Smith, who is the 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 sort of co-founder and head of Arcane Studios and is responsible for games like Dishonored and Dishonored 2. Um, who else have we had? Rami from Vlambeer. He was that's a very good episode. Um, so if you if you want to check out the show and see what it's all about, you uh, you should check out Rami's episode. I think that's a that's a good starting point. Yeah, there's um... been a whole host of all different types of people. Um, people from uh, game development, localization, games media, YouTube, voice actors. I mean, one voice actor who's been on the show, I think, is uh, appearing on your stream at some point as mm -hmm. well, which is Mr. Ray Chase, yep. the voice of Noctis and Roy in Fire Emblem yep. Heroes. So, yeah, just people from all walks of the games industry, um, anyone that I think is interesting or has interesting stories to tell about video games and such. Um, but yeah, I've been super lucky in that department. So I think pretty much any episode you choose will give you a good, a good breakdown of what the show itself is about. But um, there are definitely some highlight episodes 
um, like people like Rami and stuff like that. As you as you can sort of see on the stream right now, you can see the sort of Twitter page, and we have like the most recent episode with uh, John Riccardi from Eight Four. So please, if you're interested, go check that out. And you can definitely um, like I've listened to quite a bit of the episodes, and um, it just gets better and better. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm, like, happy. I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> it could go completely the other way, and I'm glad it's not. <laughs> yeah. Like, I think you re- really tapped into a formula that works as a podcast and that is uh, yeah. interesting to listen on a regular basis. Thank you. I- I'm glad. That's the kind of thing I wanted to make sure was... There are a lot of podcasts or a lot of... Um... I don't know, shows that sort of do the same thing, like the weekly sort of roundup of the video game news, mm-hmm. or maybe they talk about whatever game came out recently. I kind of wanted to make a podcast that wasn't time affected. Like you can listen to the first episode of the show, uh, which is almost getting on for a year and a half ago now, and you wouldn't you wouldn't know because it's talking about games from all various years with industry members that are still working or have worked in the games industry and stuff like that i didn't want it to be dated in any way Mm -hmm. so i feel like if you can make a podcast like that and people know what the formula is they will be more interested in coming more often to sort of listen because sometimes with podcasts i listen to maybe i'll miss a, a, a week's episode and then I'll check what the subjects they're talking about and it'll be like the most recent gaming news or the most recent games that have been released. Mm-hmm. And I'll be like, oh, I don't want to listen to that episode. It's dated now. Yeah. Like I have already heard enough uh, of people talk about that or something new has happened and I want to hear about that instead. So I just kind of had the idea of making a show that can't be dated with a kind of interesting sort of premise behind it. And um, I got lucky and made final games. <laughs> yeah, um, one episode that would particularly recommend is a uh, Norman episode with a uh, Norman uh, is it Car- yeah. Caruso? Um, Caruso, yeah. Caruso yeah. yeah yeah the game in historian the gaming historian yeah. yeah it was uh really interesting to hear his choices for what games he would take with him on um, the desert island uh, I wasn't expecting him to pick hotline Miami yeah that I think he's the only person to have chosen hotline Miami so far as well and that's the kind of game that I think for like a deserted island um, for a deserted island, you want like a game that has that sort of replayability and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. it was a good choice. I'm surprised I've only seen it once before. It's quite funny. There are there are some games that appear quite often, and then sometimes you get like real surprises like that. But uh, Norman's was also good for the fact that he is by name and nature a historian, both as a gaming historian, but also a real historian <laughs> like he, he studied history and stuff like that so yeah. some of the um some of the choices he chose were uh games that had like i think he chose like battlefield and stuff like that and that appealed to his sense of the historian in him and that kind of thing so i think that was also interesting too it told a bit more of uh told a bit more of a story about him mm-hmm. uh, we got uh james montagna in the chat right now yay james yeah, it's actually because of uh, James that we met in person, uh, Liam and I. That is, that is very true. James, come to TGS. Yeah, so, come to TGS so we can see you. <laughs> if uh, if he wants to join the um, the chat, he can. I have no problem inviting him. Come join us, James. I see what I can do. I can quickly make some adjustments. So yeah, go on. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <laughs> so uh, in what ways has uh, Final Games really improved since you started? Um, the ways that it's improved, I think, um, well, one, I got used to making a podcast, mm-hmm. whereas that's not something I'd really ever. Do. I'd been guests. I'd been a guest on previous podcasts, uh, like when I was an intern at Gamespot, as you mentioned. I was on the Gamespot podcast for a while at the time. I had done other small little podcasts, but um, it really stemmed from list when I worked at Rockstar. I listened to a lot of podcasts. One mm-hmm. being like Eight Four Play, which is kind of great because this week's episode is like a full circle 
thing for me where the podcast that kind of mostly inspired me to start my own podcast. Um, I, I got John on the show and stuff like that. So that was really nice. But um, it's, I think in terms of improving, it's like over time, I've, I've got better equipment. I have mm-hmm. like a nice microphone now. Uh, I know how to edit better. I know how to sort of make my audio sound better. I, as a, as a host, I understand when to talk, how to help people along who maybe don't know how to talk or make sure that people who do know how to talk, just sort of keeping them within the boundaries of time limits and also making sure that they are sort of saying the most interesting stories they possibly can and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a matter of practice. It's like anything. It's just a matter of practice. And I mean, this week's episode is what? The 65th episode of the show, which is crazy to even say, because I never thought I would get past the first episode. Um, so the fact that we're on the 65th episode now, it's like, it's just a, it's just a matter of practice, really. Mm-hmm. Um, just making sure that I am doing the best I can as a host, while also, um, I have, it's hard to describe because Final Games is a is a is sort of different podcast to others. Like mm-hmm. I am the host, but I'm just a vessel for my guest of the week to mm-hmm. talk about eight games that they've chosen. It's not about me. It's not really about the island or anything. It's about the guest and the association they have with the games they've chosen. Mm-hmm. So just being a good host and getting better at being able to facilitate that has has improved the show a lot. And also, um, just in general, like more knowledge about the games industry, understanding, you know, people who are working in game development as well as people within games media and being able to ask them questions that make sense to them, not asking like someone who, not asking someone who, you know, is works in the games media and doesn't really know much about game development, similar questions to what you'd ask like a game developer and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So always trying to sort of balance, balance that and who your guest is. Um, and also, in the in the beginning, I used to get super nervous. Yeah. Like I remember, like the my second ever episode, I had David D'Angelo, who was like the the co-creator of Shovel Knight. And Shovel Knight's a a huge game and that I really love. And I was so nervous about having like a game developer on the show, even though I'd like worked in game development and stuff like that. Um, so making sure like I don't get nervous anymore. <laughs> yeah. So I can have better. And, and bigger guests over time has also helped like having like Harvey Smith on the show and uh, you know, Rami from Bland Beer and mm-hmm. people like Ray and just trying not to, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say crack under the pressure, but definitely keep a cool head and, and act like you belong. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think that's how <laughs> I remember the first time I interviewed James, I was actually really nervous, but um, now I, uh, you know, I was able to interview Goichi Suda and not even sweat, really. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it, it comes with practice. It comes yeah. with practice and understanding that um, people listen to your show for a reason mm-hmm. and or people read your stuff for a reason and stuff like that. And um, just sort of being like, just able to understand that you have to be the best you can be and there's no there's no need to be nervous mm-hmm. people are, are willing to give you their time because they either know your work or they understand that you're a professional and that kind of thing so i think i think just being professional and getting better at being a professional has helped me improve the show in general yeah definitely um that's something that um i was telling nerbion because nerbion will be going to gamescom yeah. and um you know the fact that they already agreed to do the interview is is a uh, is a huge uh, window of opportunity and something that uh, you should really be proud of. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and it's um, it's that kind of thing. It's like people in the games industry are people who like games. So, mm-hmm. and the easiest thing for us to talk about is games. So, yeah, and that's exactly what you do yeah, on your just, show. Yeah, exactly. You just have to get them talking about the topic they know best, and um, all formalities go out the window because it's like if someone chooses you know, Mario 64 or something like that. It's like, I have played that game to death. So I know how to talk about that game with, I, it doesn't matter who that person is. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a matter of practice and also just that common ground that you have as, you know, game creators or 
uh, people who work in games media and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, you've actually jumped between working as a video game journalist and working within the industry itself a number of times. How has that shaped your perception of on the in <clears throat> how has that shaped your perception on the industry as a whole? Um, I think it's helped me to understand both sides of the industry. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny because one thing I have come to learn is that there is definitely a distinct divide between the two. Mm -hmm. um, People in the in the games media, even people who have worked in the games media for like ten to fifteen years, who uh, don't really know how games are made, mm. uh, or they don't quite understand the difficulties and such. And and this is only like a select few, but there is still some. Sometimes I'll read like an article or something like um, stuff like about like the Mass Effect Andromeda, for an example like that game getting slated and the you know people being like what have the studio been doing and being someone who's worked in development that has been difficult and stuff like that you understand that there there's always something that has gone wrong or has been difficult for those people during that development yeah and that the fact that they even get a game out eventually is kind of sometimes a miracle whether the game's bad or good is, is irrelevant it's just mm -hmm. games development is is really difficult. It's I. It's hard to describe. It is just incredibly difficult. It's an industry that's still relatively new. It's like what thirty plus years now, which is not that old at all. Um, we have these distinct. We have these distinct thoughts about the games industry. Like games companies must do crunch. Um, people have to dedicate their lives to game development and all that kind of stuff that has become the norm. Mm -hmm. So what's expected of like game developers and stuff is uh, maybe a little unrealistic in terms of an actual real job. And that can be, I think, misunderstood. But then on the flip side of that, people who work in game development who maybe get angry at games media for bad reviews or negative press or misunderstanding of something, it's also difficult because games media are just doing their job and reporting for yeah. their readers who maybe don't know as much about, you know, games or game development and that kind of thing. So it's this weird thing that I've learned that both sides can have their disagreements because of misunderstandings and such. Mm -hmm. um, but it helps me to keep a perspective. So when I have like guests from games media, I'm able to talk to them about what my experiences have been, but also with game development, which is I think something I've become more experienced in than I have with games media. Um, although I run Final Games, I don't really consider myself to be a part of the games media. I'm like this weird space, yeah. just where like I make a little fun show for people to listen to. I don't consider myself as like a reporter or anything like that. Um, it just it, it helps to offer a little more perspective and maybe a little more sympathy to both sides, I think, um, which can be incredibly lacking in the games industry, especially people who don't work in either, who but still comment all the time like oh why is this game delayed oh why is it buggy or this yeah. article is like nonsense and that kind of thing so i think i think just for me personally it's just given me a bit of perspective into both worlds and to help sort of give myself a little more sympathy um to the people who work in both because <laughs> they're both <laughs> difficult yeah and they, and they both have their unique set of challenges Exactly. And they they are both like completely different. They're like people who work in games media can't work in game development. It's a different it's an entirely different industry and vice yeah. versa. Like people who work in game development can't write articles about other games because it's just not what their skill set is. It's it, we all get bunched in together. Mm -hmm. We all get bunched into the same thing. We're all like part of the games industry. But everyone has distinctly different roles or distinctly different ideas about how to approach their their roles which can clash because everyone sometimes thinks they're so similar but they're not they're really they really are not um yeah it's it's difficult you know mm -hmm. but you just have to roll with the punches and just try and learn from each experience really so i guess um your experiences have really taught you that games the games industry is just really complex and more complex than you probably initially thought. Um, it's it becomes less about the games sometimes, mm -hmm. um, and 
the one thing I'll always say about the games industry is that the people who work in the games industry, whether it's the media, the people who work in PR, the people who work for like management, people who work in game studios, people who are animators, developers, whatever, everyone is lovely mm-hmm. at, at like a core level because we all grew up within this sort of 20 year gap from like the people who are veterans of the industry are people who are, you know, approaching their fifties now, maybe. Mm-hmm. But they're like the first bunch of people who came through because the games industry is so young. So the people who initially started the industry and basically found it, you know, like Miyamoto-san and stuff like that, he still works at Nintendo. Yeah. Like we think of Mario as always being around, but the reality is that the guy who made Mario still is working in the industry right now because it's not that old of an industry. So mm-hmm. everyone has come from this similar background where either the people who started the games industry, they all came in to this brand new industry and they learned together and all that. And then there's this people like us who are coming through now, who are sort of this next generation of people who grew up playing the same games. We grew up having friends who had common interests. That's why we work together. So everyone is lovely. Everyone is nice. And it's complex, but it's never as aggressive, I think, as people think it is. Like everyone has this shared common theme throughout their lives. Like we all grew up like playing either like the Genesis or the Super Nintendo, and everyone has similar memories from their childhood. And I don't think that's really happened before. Yeah, which is weird. Like it, it you know, you don't really hear people talking about like movies. Like, oh, we all grew up watching the same movies, and now we work in the movie industry it's different to video games so it's complex but it's a nice space to be a part of mm-hmm. professionally yeah the, and... the difficulties with the games industry in terms of like the negativity is kind of the people who aren't a part of the industry who just comment on the internet <laughs> i think yeah. that's the negativity there'll always be like youtube uh comment trolls or whatever yeah, exactly. But in terms of like working in the industry, I would never put anyone off it, yeah. saying, oh, it's complex. You might not want to do it. No, you, you should go ahead and do it because you'll work with some of the loveliest people in the world. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember we talked a little bit about um, the whole idea of like passing a torch. Um, I think the last time that we met about how yeah. that would be uh, kind of an interesting transition period for the video games industry. Yeah, well, you can see it's happening now because... We have this weird thing. It's like even, for example, like currently Nintendo is sort of going through their first trans... Or or one of their first. Obviously, they had the initial president, Mm Yamaguchi-san, down to like Iwata and now uh, Kimishima. And that's like they're going through a weird transfer. Um, They're going through a weird phase of transition where also Koizumi-san is now like the face of the Switch and stuff like that. But he's been there for like 20 years. He worked on like Super Mario 64, he worked on Ocarina of Time. So even even in their <laughs> sense, it's still like people who have been around for a long time. I see like the passing of the torch is like people who are making games by themselves. Young people who are starting to dominate the industry by making small indie games that you know, go on Steam and then sell like hundreds of thousands of copies like Undertale or Spelunky and and stuff like that. That seems to be like the passing of the torch in terms of the games industry right now, like the traditional to the sort of more underground stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still too young of an industry, I think, that there, there's been like a full passing of the torch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Nurbion, do you want to go ahead and ask the next question? Maybe he's gone. Okay. Uh, do you see yourself? <laughs> do you see yourself as more of a historian or a journalist or neither? Um, I would probably have to say neither. Um, I, I guess my show comes under historian because it's Mm -hmm. almost like documenting it's like documenting people who are quite notable in the games industry and the games that they 
that are important to them. Mm -hmm. That's almost kind of documentation. But some of the, like, sometimes there are questions that I'll ask on the show, or I try my best not to either get political or to go into depth with maybe guests who have had issues in the games industry before and stuff like that, where the, we've had guests who have had like canceled games or um, they've been fired or they've had difficulties. I try not to press too much into stuff like that. So um, sometimes it does come up and we'll talk about it, but yeah, definitely less of a, less of a journalist and more of a sort of historian. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a talk show. I don't know if that counts as a sort of, journalist kind of like a third option yeah kind of like would you describe like conan o'doyle as like a journalist <laughs> or a historian like that's the that's where i would sort of put it <laughs> just a weird gaming talk show that has a specific structure mm -hmm. i think all uh, right oh nervion's back yeah my <laughs> internet got cut off so i heard not the last sentence you spoke so now i think I don't know what uh, was this question already asked. Got asked what guests uh, would you like to have on the future? Say that again, sorry. Ah, what guest would you like to have on the on in the future? Oh, in the future, um, oh, there has been, there have been. It's it's strange because there have been people. I when I when I when I initially came up with the show, I wrote a list down of all the people. I initially wanted to have on the show, or eventually have on the show. Mm -hmm. And um, it's funny now I'm getting to sort of the bottom of that list. I kept adding more people, but I seem to have got everyone I sort of ever, ever wanted <laughs> on the show. Um, but there are still plenty of people out there. Um, there are also other ideas I have about expanding it beyond what it is currently. Um, I've not, I've not actually mentioned this before, but one thing I'm hoping to work out is uh, I want to make like a short video series um, about Japanese creators and their eight games. Okay. So to have, I want, because I live in Japan and I, I'm inspired by Japanese games and the creators of Japanese games, um, one of my future projects is I hope to make maybe like a video series where we can have Japanese creators, you know, like Mizuguchi-san or like Ononuma or like Aya and just like all these incredible Japanese creators who have been making some of our favorite games for the, over the years. Like what games inspire them? Like I don't, that never really gets asked of like the Japanese creators. It's more just like asking them about the games they make. But can you, can you like thinking of like Mizuguchi-san who made Res like, what inspired him to like get into the games industry or what games inspired him to like make res? I think that's really interesting, but to do that, like in a podcast form would be really difficult because you would have either you'd have to dub it or you would have to, or you'd maybe have to sort of, uh, have someone translate live on air, which would make the show doubly as long as it is already. And the show is quite usually two hours so then you would have maybe a four hour show and that doesn't quite work so i think if i can i would like to make like a short video series that's specifically about japanese creators like maybe five to ten episodes uh of all these different japanese creators with subtitles in a sort of nice setting and we talk about the eight games that inspire them so that's kind of my thoughts right now of like what i want to do in the future um in terms of like specific guests um, I don't know, really. I'm open to anyone coming on the show and anyone who has like an interesting background and that kind of thing. So I'm always on the lookout for new guests. Have you heard of uh, Toko Toko? They're, Toko Toko. Uh... Yeah, Toko Toko TV. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, I think um, what you're thinking of is would be a great... Uh, it would complement that series as well. Because, um, yeah, because I've, th I've seen a few of their mm -hmm. sort of episodes as well, like with Yoko Taro and... Um, you know, Mizuguchi san as well, right? Yeah. So, but yeah, that's the kind of thing I would be aiming for. They they focus more on the person, I think, like um, more as like an artist. Yes. Or uh, yeah, as like a creator, because yeah. they do other people as well, like manga creators, like mangaka and, and stuff mm -hmm. like that as well, don't they? Yeah, yeah. So like, like, like in my head, like I like really nerd out thinking like, what would like Yoko Taro's eight games be? Like, what would Yoko Taro? 
what games does he play that inspires him or like kamiya san like yeah those guys who have made games like nia or bayonetta or like beautiful joe and devil may cry or, or like uh mikami who made like resident evil like what eight games would they choose and like where what's the deserted place they want to go to and all that kind of thing that like really really excites me and i i really want to be able to do that one day mm -hmm. um so hopefully that's sort of my future plan yeah um so i guess uh, that kind of answers our next question is what do you plan on shaking up the formula at some point or starting a different kind of podcast yeah so um i've been approached about sort of doing other podcasts and stuff like that and um i'm very good friends with uh, George Weedman, who does the Super Bunny Hop mm -hmm. YouTube channel. Yep. And um, George has just launched his new Patreon, and um, he is doing really well. And one of his options was to start a new podcast because he used to do the That One Video Gamer podcast with like yep. Sunder and Matt Visual and stuff like that. Uh, and they had me as a guest, and it was really good. And uh, me and George talk games all the time. So we, we had ideas of maybe starting a new podcast at some point, but we haven't formally decided on anything or anything so that might happen at some point but in terms of like final games um i don't want to shake up the formula too much i think the formula is is good and it's it's not to, uh, to me i hope it's not to anyone else either i don't think it can get boring because each guest is unique mm -hmm. in their own way even if they talk about the same game yeah. um, or some of the same games come up they all have differently unique experiences so it always is going to be fresh each episode. Um, but yeah, in terms of like expanding beyond final games to do stuff like the Japanese creators video series and stuff like that, that's kind of like initially what I'll probably do. Yeah. Okay. And then um, uh, I'll go ahead and nerf, nerf it on. Oh, okay. Oh, and I might take it. All right. So what are some of the games you would love? Oh, no that you would have wanted to take with you to a deserted place but didn't necessarily make sense to bring for example uh, okay oh you get it all right so like, so <laughs> go like, ahead so like, so, so like more more nostalgic choices yeah maybe games that uh, might have lacked long-term replayability or games that aren't as strong with nostalgia that like they don't uh, necessarily okay. make sense to bring but they're still really good games um, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting choice because one thing that has sort of happened over Final Games is that when I initially came up with the concept for the show, I thought, like, everyone would choose eight nostalgic games. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, if we're talking about eight games you play forever, you would take, like, your nostalgia choices. Um, but that soon dissipated. It soon dissipated, and people started choosing stuff with the idea of being stuck for yep. a long time. So games like Minecraft or like League of Legends or games that have immense replayability um, came up. So I was like, oh, it is less about nostalgia, but you still get people who choose nostalgia. Uh, I feel like some people split it between the four nostalgia mm -hmm. and then the four, uh, like sort of, we call it the practicality choices. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in terms of like, if I was going pure nostalgia, um, games like Chrono Trigger or Pokemon Gold, um, games that for me I've never really replayed again. Mm -hmm. Short experiences, maybe as well. Um, like I remember the first time I played Uncharted Two. That was an that was an incredible experience. Uh, it'd be nice to like have that same experience again. Or like small indie titles as well, like Super Meat Boy and stuff like that. Um, like once you like, I know they would last like a long time, but I don't necessarily feel they have the same replayability as stuff like Super Mario Maker or mm -hmm. um, like an MMO and stuff like that. Uh, so games like that, I think, would stand out for me. A lot of like old Game Boy titles as well. Yeah, like Donkey Kong for Game Boy, uh, the Super Mario Mini Classics for Game Boy as well would stand out. Um, there are so there are so many choices. <laughs> All the older uh, RPGs for like the Super Nintendo, Snowboard Kids for the N sixty four. There are there are too many choices, but there there yeah. are there are many. <laughs> I'm always surprised uh, when people don't pick a DS 
or uh, a Game Boy Advance for their final choice for their console. Ah, okay. Yeah, so the, the last question I always ask everyone um, is, you know, we, we talk about games all the time on Final Games, but um, if you could only take one console with you, what, what would you take? And um, the ones that come up most of the time is stuff like, you know, the Xbox 360s come up a few times. Mm -hmm. The Dreamcast, surprisingly, the Dreamcast has come up a lot. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. Like, we've only had the DS once, I think. Yeah, because with the DS, you could the bring the Game Boy games as well. You could, but also, if you think about just the the DS, or if you take yeah. the 3DS, mm -hmm. like, the, the library is huge. I think, like, yeah. I don't have huge game i don't have like a massive game collection but my my biggest sort of collection is my ds games i have like over a hundred ds games i'm thinking there are so many there are so many games to the ds that would be a really good choice yeah. um but yeah you can't deny stuff like the playstation 2 which has like a catalog mm -hmm. of like thousands of games and oh yeah the xbox 360 has quite a catalog as well even the super nintendo in terms of has a big catalog and also the catalog has quite a lot of quality in it mm -hmm. uh, so it is difficult but there have been some really good choices i think that some people have chosen the wii um some people chose the wii u which is uh, quite quite interesting mm -hmm. um but yeah it, it's definitely i think personal preference i don't think people take back catalog into the equation too much i think they think specifically about what console they enjoy the most mm -hmm. so that's why like people have chosen like the dreamcast and stuff like that yeah because yeah definitely if I, if I were to pick a console just on the features of the console itself i'd probably pick the gamecube but um if i was thinking of the back catalog and everything it would definitely be like the DS. yeah 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 like the you know the gamecube it has the controller i love it's a nice little full impact it has like you know the nice little menu you can do like the little baby squeal and hold the button down when you're like um, sort Actually, of booting it up and stuff like that. <laughs> if you have uh, one uh, of the early Wii's, you could do GameCube backwards compatibility as well. That's true. You can, yeah. Um, yeah, because even like uh, James, yeah. James chose the Wii and stuff like that. So <laughs> it's <laughs> it's definitely personal preference, I think. Um, I, I think it depends on the games you like and oh, yeah, how definitely. you kind of like to play games. Like... It's like right now when I think of like what console I really enjoy playing on, mm -hmm. well, it's the Switch. I love playing on the Switch. I want every video game to be on the Switch. <laughs> <laughs> I love yeah. playing games on the Switch so much. I've been playing Sonic Mania for like the past three days nonstop, and it's so much fun. Yeah. But although there are incredible games on the Switch right now, Zelda, Splatoon, Mario Kart, um, Sonic Mania, uh, there are in so many great games. What's the future going to be like? Like past this year? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're not it's sure. Like, yeah, this year is great, but like, is next year going to be as good, or even like half as good? Is like the next five years going to be good? So by the time the Switch gets to the end of its life cycle, is it going to be the console I'd want to take? Well, it's difficult to say. Yeah. Are there any games that you are sick of popping up in final games? Um, there have been a few that when people send me the lists, I maybe mention to them, oh, this has been chosen before, um, you can still take it if you want, but if you'd rather talk about something maybe a little different, or if you were, if you're dead certain on this game, okay, but if you were sort of maybe batting it back and forth with other choices, maybe you can think about the other choices. Games like The Witcher 3 came up a lot, uh, last year, uh, Dark Souls comes up all the time. It's surprising because you think games like you know Zelda Ocarina of Time or like Super Mario or those kind of games they don't come up as often because they are the pure nostalgia games. Mm -hmm. But the games that are like practical games come up a little more often. Like games like Minecraft come up quite often. Um, Tetris has come up a quite. Tetris a bit. has come up a few times, but I understand the Tetris choice. Yep. So. I, d I try not to deny them that, but I think, oh, have you played like Pac-Pon or, or maybe Puyo Puyo or something like that? Um, I don't ever try and influence anyone's choices on the show. So mm -hmm. if they do want to take Dark Souls or if they do want to take, uh, I don't know, something like Minecraft or something, well, then that's up to them. And at the end of the day, their 
choice is their choice, but it's sometimes a little because because having to get the music for the games reminds me of what I've listened to a lot. <laughs> so I've listened to like the OST for like Dark Souls and The Witcher Three so many times, and I think I have like a I think I have a folder on my laptop somewhere that's called Regular Occurrences, and it's just the OSTs. For like all the games that appear all the time, so I don't have to keep re-downloading them and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, it's a uh... <laughs> so some games do come up a lot, but I try my best not to influence anyone's yeah one decisions. Game... <laughs> one game that I was really surprised that hasn't really come up that much, at least in the episodes that I've listened to so far, uh, was Civilization. Um, but are there any choices that have kind of surprised you? Um, yeah, there have been loads of choices actually that have surprised me. All games I just have no idea about. Mm -hmm. um, Ray Chase, who came on the show, um, voice actor for Noctis, um, he chose like weird MS DOS mm -hmm. collection titles, like stuff that was like poker and stuff like that, that I had no idea about and I had no idea why anyone would want to take them, but he wanted to take them. Yeah. Um, even uh, his colleague who plays Prompto, Robbie Diamond, he chose Wet Tricks, mm -hmm. the water yes. puzzle yeah. game for the N64 developed by the, uh, uh, oh, what's their names? The two brothers from the UK. Yeah, we, uh, we interviewed one of them for Source Gaming. Excellent. Yeah, those yeah. guys, those really cool guys. Um, so, uh, you know, we had like Wetrix. Um, James. Oh, uh, James. <laughs> yeah, James, he... <laughs> James had an incredible list, but they're all games I liked, so maybe they weren't as surprising. Well, the, the, but, chat, the, um, chat, the chat program was pretty surprising. Yeah, the chat program was pretty surprising. And also the Game Boy. So mm -hmm. the Game Boy camera was really a good choice. Um, Jean Ricciardi, who came on this week's show, uh, he chose his last choice was a surprise. He didn't want to tell me what it was. People try their best to try not to tell me before going mm -hmm. live, but I always convince them. But he was determined to not tell me what his final choice was, and it was um, Pokemon Go. Oh. So that's been one of the most interesting ones is to take Pokemon Go. Um, there have been lots of crazy, weird choices, but yeah, definitely some surprises. If anyone's listened to the William Pugh episode, uh, William Pugh of the Stanley Parable fame, mm -hmm. uh, that's that's the most unique. <laughs> I won't tell you why, <laughs> but you should listen to that episode. Uh, every choice on his list on that one is a unique, jokey answer. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I heard on your Twitter page that you live in Japan. I do. <laughs> How is it? I do indeed. <laughs> How's it been living in Japan? <laughs> uh, it's been wonderful. I actually like maybe five days ago was my two year and. Oh no, um, kidding. Yeah, so two years <laughs> now, two years and five days in Japan. Um, mm -hmm. Surprisingly enough, actually, I've only ever ridden. I've only ever like uh, been on the Shinkansen three times since I've been in Japan mm -hmm. and each time has been on August the 15th of this year, last year and the year before. Huh. Surprisingly right. enough. I don't know why that happened, but <laughs> that came up the other day when I was coming back to Tokyo last week. Um, I was like, wow, this is my second anniversary in Japan. It's also exactly the same day that I've read on the Shinkansen for three years in a row now. How weird. Uh, but yeah, I've lived in Japan for two years now. Uh, I love living here. It's amazing. It's such a wonderfully nice lifestyle. Yeah. It's, it's easy and um, it's easy and the transport is good and the food is great and everyone's really nice and stuff like that. Apart from the summer because fuck Japanese summers. Yeah. They're the worst. They're hot. <laughs> They're hot, and I don't envy you, Will, because you live like in Shiga, mm -hmm. and that is like the hottest part of Japan. No, and no, I... it's worse in Kumamoto, in Kyushu. Really? Yeah. Really? It gets worse. Oh my god, I can't even imagine it being worse than what it is here in Okayama, which is kind of like Kyoto. It's it's awful. Like, don't if you if you're planning on coming to Japan and you're interested in coming to Japan, 
don't come between July and August. I would, I would say don't come during the winter because the Japanese houses, they don't have insulation. They don't have insulation, but you're more than likely to stay in a house. Are you? You're going to stay in a hotel. Okay, that's if true. If you come to Japan. Yeah, if you're just visiting. But if you want to, like, walk around, you want to, like, like, go to temples, you want to walk up mountains, you want to go... Mm-hmm. Or you want to, like, even, like, in Tokyo and you want to go to, like, Akihabara and there's loads of people and stuff like that, don't come in the summer. It's too hot. You'll be sweaty and tired and just a little miserable because you'll be so tired. It's it's difficult yeah. <laughs> when summer rolls around <laughs> in Japan. That's what I... But other than that, every the other 10 months of the year are great. <laughs> <laughs> what has surprised you about Japan? And anything you were disappointed with or shocked? Um, Find out. In terms of like what surprised me about Japan, I think maybe just um, like the the thing that surprises me the most, and I think we can all sort of come from some ways. When you move to Japan, you have this idea, especially if you grew up watching anime or playing video games and stuff like that, like of this kind of like nerd mecca almost. Like, you go to Akihabara and stuff like that, and you, you expect, like, it's going to be, like, this nerd culture center where you're going to be, like, accepted. And, like, everything you liked when you were a kid that you maybe got bullied for or something like that, like, all of a sudden that's going to be, like, totally fine when you move to Japan, which is, like, the home of, like, Mario and Zelda and, and like, Dragon Ball and stuff like that. But it's entirely the opposite. Like, being, like, an otaku in Japan is still seen as, like, a bad thing. Even though Japan knows that its like biggest export is like soft power stuff like anime and video games, mm -hmm. but being an otaku is still not like an, a socially accepted thing, which is weird. Which then means that you sort of look when you move to Japan, you expect less for in terms of like video games and maybe anime and stuff like that, and you look more towards what Japan offers. Other than that, and then. The yeah. reasons I love Japan and I live in Japan now are nothing to do with video games. They're nothing to do with anime. It's more like the nature, uh, the transport, the people, the, the 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 fact that they have festivals all the time and everyone has like public holidays and just the just the way they live their normal day to day life that you don't know about until you arrive ends up being the reason why you want to stay so much. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's the same for Will, but like, combinis, like, I don't think I can live now my my life without having a combini near me. <laughs> like, they're just, just like, these are the things that become ingrained into your daily life. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The reason you moved to Japan in the first place may be inspired by Japanese culture because you grew up playing video games and anime, quickly becomes something that you don't care too much about anymore and you care more about other things i think it was uh john uh maybe it was john um he was tweeting about uh talking with a japanese person and um they said why isn't japanese tv more exp exported or something like that like japanese people can't understand like why people are more interested in anime and video games than japanese tv but uh, I've never and, been <laughs> I've never been a fan of Japanese TV. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say like the reason is for anyone who doesn't know, Japanese TV consists of two things: cooking shows and talk shows, and that's it. Or, or, or what do they call them in Japan? Like variety shows. Yeah, variety shows. Um, they do some travel shows. To be fair, they do some travel shows, but it's travel within Japan. Yeah. Usually. They don't travel abroad <laughs> very often. It's, it's well, difficult to meet Japanese people who who don't speak English who have been to a different country. They had a a, a series that they would go abroad with someone, a foreigner that lived in Japan, and they would spend the whole episode, you know, obviously speaking Japanese and everything. But they would be yeah. doing like very stereotypical things in that country, like eating. <laughs> yeah, like like complaining about the food not being as yeah, something like that, bro. <laughs> it's funny because like Japanese TV is like it, it's only ever like three things as you said it's like it's like a variety show that maybe has segments on like mm -hmm. food and like travel or it's like a specific TV show about food like no matter what you think like any stereotype you have about Japan 
the one about Japan loving food is right. Yeah. Like Japanese people do, love food. They love food. That's all they talk about. It's what they're proud of. It's like food is like the, one of the most important things in Japan, as you can gather, because Japanese food is amazing. Yeah, um, it, it is amazing. And the only other thing is sports. Like, the, <laughs> <laughs> like when you turn on the TV, like you'll. It's like maybe early in the morning and it's like children's TV or it's late at night and you watch like Jojo or something because yeah um it's it, it's just like it's it's different <laughs> and uh it's it's boring <laughs> the TV shows up boring. <laughs> some Japanese dramas are okay I'm a, I, I there is like one reality show I like it's called Terrace House I don't okay. know if anyone's heard of that I haven't heard uh, of that. but yeah yeah, it's on Netflix, like Netflix Japan, you can watch it. It's got quite a following in the West because it's a bit more interesting. But yeah. You, you, um, you're missing the best TV show that comes on uh, once a year, the Don't Laugh episodes. They come on out uh, on oh, New Year's. I've heard of them, I've never watched them. Oh, they're amazing. They be, uh, That is kind of... For anyone who doesn't know, they basically of... like torture people into... Um, like, if, if they laugh, they get hit, like smacked. And um, they yeah, put them through like all I... these ridiculous situations where you're, it's almost impossible not to laugh. And it's funny because like pretty much the only time of the year that the variety shows become interesting is like New Year's. Yeah. Because they make all sort of like more game showy stuff where they all have like competitions or they have like sports competitions or mm -hmm. um like i remember watching one last year i can't remember which one it was but like they try they have like two teams and they have to do loads of different challenges like um one was like how many of your team can you fit in a van and they're all trying to like squeeze into a tiny japanese <laughs> van or they have to like draw like specific kanji with like giant calligraphy brushes on like a giant piece of paper yep. while having paint thrown at them or like walking across <laughs> like like yeah or like and they have like a there's like a rotating platform and they have to like jump on the rotating platform and then try and paint the kanji and they just like <laughs> fall off every time it's really funny but it only happens like once a year <laughs> yeah it, it's because uh new year's is a huge family holiday so everyone's stuck at home and eating food and uh just hanging out with their family so they they actually have good shows on new year's yeah, <laughs> the rest of the time Japanese TV is, is, is bad. Yeah, it's it's really bad. <laughs> so, uh, do you have any particular favorite pl places in Japan? You've done a lot of traveling within Japan. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I traveled to most of these. Like people would consider, you know, like Osaka, Kyoto, Tokyo, Hiroshima, uh, Fukuoka, and stuff like that. Um, Tokyo is still my favorite place in Japan um, it's so different from what I grew up with in the UK like mm -hmm. London is you know kind of the only representation of like a, a city but even then compared to Tokyo London is so small and mm, sort of not has anything going for it in terms of like stuff to do but Tokyo is just like an incredible place that has like lots of little cities inside of a big city and each little city has like its own sort of vibe and feel going on for it um so tokyo is my favorite place in japan but for anyone who lives in japan they know that tokyo is not real japan yeah tokyo is fake japan there's japanese people there's japanese food but it's not really what japanese life is like mm -hmm. um so in terms of like i feel like if you want to feel if you want to see like a good representation of Japan, but also kind of touristy, well, Osaka is the best place, I think. You can go to Kyoto and stuff like that, and you can see Kiyomizu and all those kind of stuff, but I feel like if you want to get a good representation of like a proper Japanese city with like Japanese people who are very friendly and stuff, but also kind of touristy, well, Osaka is the best place to go. Yeah, I love um, Kansai people. That's why I moved back down here. I initially... Um... I was living in Fukushima, and uh, the okay. pe yeah, the people there are very different than um, Kansai people. So uh, yeah. I wanted to be back in this area because uh, people are just uh, brighter, they're happier, more approachable. Agreed. Yeah, definitely. Kansai people are very friendly. Tokyo is a big city, so it's understandable that people are a bit more an anonymous and sort of mm -hmm. keep themselves to themselves in Tokyo. Um, but yeah. Uh, 
Osaka is like the friendliest place in Japan, I feel like. They don't get too many tourists, apart from like in the Shinsaibashi area around, mm -hmm. you know, the Goriko Man and stuff like that. So there yeah. are areas of Osaka that is just like Japanese people and there are like really nice izakayas and stuff. So yeah, mm -hmm. if, you, if you're going to come to Japan and you want like a real taste of Japan while keeping it a little bit safe and you can go to the touristy places, well, go to Osaka. I'd if say... you want to see like real Japan, yeah. come to like Okayama, where I live. <laughs> <laughs> come to like my city and you'll see like Japan. There's no touristy things here, so <laughs> yeah. you can just see beautiful Japan. <laughs> uh, I also really like uh, Nagoya. Nagoya is a really I fantastic see... city. Nagoya is only a place I've been like a few times, so I don't really know Nagoya. Mm -hmm. It's like the one city I have not had too like Nagoya and Hiroshima are like the two places I don't know too much about. So uh, yeah. I've only spent maybe like a one one day in each. So mm -hmm. yeah, Hiroshima. Um, Hiroshima is another city that I want to spend more time in as well. Yeah, because Hiroshima is really close to uh, where I live. I live mm -hmm. in basically dot in the middle between Hiroshima and Osaka. So. I should probably go to Hiroshima more often, but I just don't. When I have the money, I'd rather go up to Osaka to see other game developers and stuff like that, yep. or go to Tokyo and <laughs> and see game developers as well. So, <laughs> yeah, we got James with Wakayama. Uh, I lived yeah. I lived in Wakayama in high school. It's a really it's a really nice country prefecture. Like, there's a lot, uh, they have really good mikans there. Really? Yeah, the the Mikons in in Wakayama are famous. Oh, nice! I'm gonna have to try and find myself a Wakayama Mikan. Uh, I live in Wakayama. We're famous for peaches because of Momotaro. Oh yeah. The stories of Momotaro. So mm -hmm. we have Momo. We have very famous peaches and also Kibidango. Okay. Which is like a small sort of rice bowl, that's like a sweet. Uh, it's okay. It's not great. <laughs> it's not the right <laughs> home about. <laughs> but okay, I'm famous for it. So. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I think that's um, almost wraps up our time with you. Uh, so where can people Excellent. find you? Um. So you can find me on I'm on Twitter, Liam B M E. And you can also find Final Games at Final Games Show. Um, where like. I think we're like 900 plus followers now, so it'd be cool to get to like a thousand within the next month or so, which would be super nice. Um, you can find the show on iTunes and Stitcher and Acast and all those wonderful places. And you can also find it on SoundCloud, which is where it's hosted and most people listen to it, um, which is great. And um, yeah, uh, also if you're interested in game development and stuff like that, I'm currently making a small Star Man Suzuki san, which is a game about. A salary man, a Japanese salary man who, who you have to get to work. So I post like dev progress about that game uh, quite often on Twitter. So yeah, if you want to find me, just go to at Liam BME on Twitter and talk to me. Okay, awesome. I'm trying to find a picture of uh, salary man Suzuki. Uh, he's probably he's probably quite far down. I, the other day, I, um, yeah, you went to the Poke Park. Yeah, and I, I went to uh, uh, Tokyo. Oh, here we uh, go. So, um, uh, and I showed him off for the first time publicly. Yeah, so uh, I saw someone uh, named Suzuki-san playing it. Yes, yeah, that was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> we had like a guy who was like, "My name is Suzuki-san." Um, I'm making. Oh yeah, so the uh, the level you is a level that wasn't finished at the time. It was just be testing a sort of combini level, but that level is now finished. Um, okay. So as you can see, this is sort of like a Japanese combini, uh -huh. and the idea is to get this Suzuki man who can do flips over boxes to work. It's a, an auto scroll uh, platformer title, and uh, if you like like Japanese aesthetic, then you'll like this.